friends. <clears throat> I'm still on my study of Mary Magdalene, one of the women who encountered Jesus when he was on earth doing his ministry. And I'm enjoying it very much, uh, but it is a, a kind of a, um, a puzzle to put together in a way. Don't you just love a mystery where there's different facts all over through the whole book and you're reading along and you're trying to put together all those facts. And you can think of it a little bit like a, a courtroom scene where different witnesses get on the stand and each witness has a little something else to add. And eventually, if you put them all together, it fleshes out the whole picture of what really happened. And that's kind of what we have to do with the story of Mary Magdalene at the cross because there are four gospel writers who witnessed these events and wrote about them. And so each of them has a little bit different perspective of what happened. Some mention her specifically, some don't. And it, I had to go through quite a few different verses in quite a few different gospels to put the whole picture together. So last time we said that Mary Magdalene was at the cross standing with Mary the mother of Jesus and Mary Clopas, who was probably Mary's, Mary the mother of Jesus, sister-in-law, maybe married to Joseph's brother. And they also call her Mary the mother of James the Lesser and Joseph. And those three are mentioned specifically at that point, standing near the cross. And then later it also says women were standing at a distance watching this. So that was the first time we saw Mary Magdalene mentioned. Now let's move along further in the story at the actual death of Jesus and um, laying his body in the tomb. So I went through different scriptures here. And the first one I, I wanted to look at is in Luke. Okay, so I'm going to say them kind of slowly because in case you want to look them up or write them down or anything. Um, the first one is Luke 23. And I'm going to start at verse 44. So Luke 23, 44. Uh, and this is going to detail the actual death of Jesus. By this time it was about noon, and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone, and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. Then Jesus shouted, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. And with those words, he breathed his last. When the Roman officer overseeing the execution saw what had happened, he worshipped God and said, Surely this man was innocent. And when all the crowd that came to see the crucifixion saw what had happened, they went home in deep sorrow. And Jesus' friends, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching. Thinking about this, um, we know that we wonder why weren't any other people named? Why, weren't, why don't we hear Peter is there or James or any of them. I mean, we hear about the, um, the, uh, we hear about John only from when he was with Jesus' mother, and, and Jesus, uh, says, he just, he isn't named because John, when he writes his gospel, refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. But we do know that it's John, so John must have been there. And I'm assuming the other disciples were there. But we don't know that because they're not listed. Okay, we're, we're not told. We are told the women, though, which is quite interesting that they're mentioned. And notice this is the women who had followed him from Galilee, the ones we talked about before, who were with him on his ministry in Galilee, who ministered to him, who took care of the practical things, who were um, um, giving of their resources to take care of him. Women at that time would not have been allowed probably to go in and defend him when he was before Pilate or, you know, or do anything in terms of helping him that way, but they could help his needs. They could minister to him that way. So that, after that, we come to the burial of Jesus. 
This is verse 50. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph. He was a member of the Jewish high council, but he had not agreed with the decisions and actions of the other religious leaders. He was from the town of Arimathea in Judea, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. So what do we know about him right now is he was good and righteous. He was a good man. He was a member of the Jewish high council, but he did not agree with what they did. And he was from a town called Arimathea. So we refer to him a lot of times as Joseph of Arimathea. And he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come means he must have known about Messiah. And he was looking to Jesus as that Messiah of the kingdom to come. He went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Then he took the body down from the cross and wrapped it in a long sheet of linen cloth and laid it in a new tomb that had been carved out of rock. This was done late on Friday afternoon, the day of preparation, as the Sabbath was about to begin. So here we are later on Friday, but Sabbath hasn't started yet. And Sabbath would have started at sundown and go to the following sundown. Uh, and as the body was taken away, this is verse 55, as his body was taken away, the women from Galilee followed and saw the tomb where his body was placed. It's very important that as, as Luke is doing this, he's showing us witnesses. The women that followed him in Galilee followed along right to the tomb and saw where Jesus was laid. Later on, when these women go to the tomb, if we didn't know that they had seen where Jesus' body was, we might say, well, they got confused. They went to the wrong tomb. Jesus really didn't rise from the dead. You know, they were at the wrong place. No, they knew exactly where he was laid because they followed along behind and saw the tomb where his body was placed. And watch what they did next. Then they went home and prepared spices and ointments to anoint his body. But by the time they were finished, the Sabbath had begun, so they rested, as was required by the law. So they're righteous women. They're trying to follow the laws, but they're also preparing these spices and ointments to take to the tomb the next day. I think it's interesting that women are always practical, aren't they? Where are the men? You know, like, obviously, Joseph is there, Joseph of Arimathea. He's helping out, bringing Jesus' body to the tomb. Where are all the disciples? What are they doing? The women, just like in any funeral, I think, the women are thinking practical. Let's get together these spices. We're going to need them tomorrow. We don't want to prepare them during the Sabbath. So let's, uh, let's make sure that we get these together now while we can. So that's, that's Luke's account. Let's see what John adds when he does his account. This is John chapter 19. Let's look at that one and see if it's, it's, it's going to be the same account, but it also is going to um, give us a little more information that was left, that, that, that uh, Luke did not put in his account. So let's see, what's, where should I start? Let's start at verse uh, 38. This is after Jesus body is taken down from the cross. Verse 38 of John 19. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. Now we find out that not only was Joseph of Arimathea part of the high council, but he was secretly follower of Jesus. And he didn't always tell everybody that, but he knew Jesus and he was following his beliefs and following the teachings of Jesus. And notice he's the one that goes to Pilate. Peter doesn't go to Pilate and ask for the body. John doesn't go to Pilate and ask for the body. You know, you, you do wonder where the disciples are in all of this. Have they fled? I don't know. But 
they aren't taking care of these practical things. They're probably just so stunned that they just are immobilized almost, you know. And here comes Joseph of Arimathea, probably a pretty rich man, a prosperous man, part of the council, a secret follower of Jesus. And he's the one that goes to Pilate and asks him for the body. And somebody comes along with him. Look at number, uh, verse 39. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. So now we have another secret believer who came to visit Jesus at night. That's Nicodemus. And he comes along with Joseph of Arimathea. And watch what Nicodemus brings. This is so great. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Now, myrrh and aloes would have been a typical embalming fluid kind of thing that people would use even in Egypt at the time. But what I found interesting is it's myrrh that was brought to Jesus by the wise men at his birth. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And now at his death, Nicodemus is bringing myrrh. There's something very symbolic about that, you know, that that myrrh is there. Um, myrrh was a gift for the king, you know, and, and he's bringing it here. Aloes would have been a very fragrant perfume. So both of these things are ointments or perfume with spices to make it smell better. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them, now Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, just the two of them, wrapped the body with spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. That would have been written in the Talmud. They would have had certain, they were, they were, their custom was to bury the body right away. They didn't, they didn't wait a long time or have a wake like we would maybe today. Um, they believed in burying the, the body quickly. Um, and so, it would have, they, they would have done all of this in accordance with whatever the burial customs of the time were from the Jewish Talmud. At the place where Christ was, where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. So they didn't waste any time, took his body down, wrapped with the spices Nicodemus brought with him, wrapped it in linen, and the women were watching and knowing where the tomb was. So that's what, um, that's what John adds. Now, we've done John and Luke. What about Matthew? What does Matthew say about this whole proceeding? Okay, so Matthew, we are in Matthew 27, starting at 51, um, because we have uh, the curtain breaking or ripping at this point, okay? And it says, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, the tombs were broke open. The bodies of holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. And now we get into the women. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, mother the, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. So we're adding another Mary now. We've got Mary Magdalene. We know she was there. We know Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. That would be Mary Clopas. Okay, and now we've got the mother of Zebedee's sons, and the mother of Zebedee's sons would have been this Mary Salome. She would have been the mother of James and John, who were apostles. That's why when we talk about Mary Clopas, they sometimes say James the Lesser, because this Mary would have been the mother of James the Greater. <laughs> so we've got three Marys there that are mentioned. And now they get into the burial, Fifth, uh, verses verse 57 of Matthew 27. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered it given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean linen cloth, and placed it in his, new, his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. 
he rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. So now we have two Marys that are very close to the tomb. They're sitting right there watching. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. I guess the other Mary would have been Mary, the mother of Jesus. So there were lots of Marys here, but they all saw. And notice Mary Magdalene, she stays right to the bitter end, right till that stone was pushed right into the tomb. It doesn't say that there were any disciples with her or, or anything. I mean, these women were there to witness that Jesus was put into the tomb, that the stone was rolled in there. This is the right tomb, the right place, a new tomb that Joseph of Arimathea had. And I think it, it, it shows again her devotion, her passion. She wasn't giving up on him. She was there to the bitter end, you know. Um, she, she must have been an amazing woman, really an amazing woman. Well, there's one more gospel account, and that is in the, loop, in, in the book of Mark. And Mark gives us just a few more details. So let's look at that one. I can open it up here. And this is in Mark chapter 15. Um, and we're going to start with verse 40. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Younger and Joseph, and Salome. Now again, Salome would have been the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Okay, Mary Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. It was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. I think boldly is important here because I think it was chancy for Joseph to do this. He was secretly following Jesus, but now he's, Jesus is gone and he's like, hey, I'm going to come out with it, you know? He's coming out of the closet in a way that he, he isn't going to hide this anymore. He was a follower of Jesus and he's going boldly to Pilate and saying, hey, I want the body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he'd already died. Jesus was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him, has Jesus already died? And when he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. This is an important fact because it had to be proven by a witness that Jesus actually was physically dead. Otherwise, when he rose from the grave, people might have said, well, he didn't really die, though. They probably put him in there alive, and he just stayed there a couple days and then came out. No, the centurion was asked by Pilate, and the centurion went and actually stuck the spear in the side and made sure Jesus was dead. Again, these are eyewitness accounts. If we were in a trial, that would be very, very important to say, no, he wasn't faking it. It wasn't just that we took his body down off the cross and we just assumed he was dead. No, the centurion went and checked, and he was dead. So Joseph brought some fine linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in linen, and placed it in the tomb cut out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Mary, mother of Joseph, I'm assuming would been Mary Clopas. But again, the Marys are all over the place, so it's hard to know. Um, there are eyewitness accounts from Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, and the women. Mary Magdalene prominently among them because she's always mentioned by name. Whenever the other women are there, she's always listed by name. So she must have been a very strong disciple of Jesus. So, there you have it. We know Mary was at the cross, and we know she was now at the tomb when Jesus was laid there. So we're going to find more about the resurrection when we look at the next session. Have a blessed day.